Hi everyone, in this video we will be going over pulmonary and systemic gas exchange as well as gas transport. Before we discuss gas exchange, let's review the cellular respiration equation as well as the five major processes involved in respiration. Let's take a look at the reaction. We can see that the reactants are glucose and oxygen and the products are carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. As we know, this reaction occurs at the tissue cells to produce energy. It is important to note that because oxygen is a reactant, it is constantly being consumed, and thus its concentration decreases inside the tissue cells. On the other hand, carbon dioxide is a product, and thus it is constantly accumulating inside the tissue cells. This creates a pressure gradient, which will be discussed shortly. Also, I have jotted down a few points to keep in mind. Remember that we inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. The pathway for oxygen begins at the alveoli, which are tiny air sacs located inside the lungs. It then travels through the bloodstream and into the tissue cells to be used for cellular respiration. The carbon dioxide pathway begins at the tissue cells. As mentioned earlier, carbon dioxide builds up at the tissue cells because of cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide then travels through the bloodstream and into the alveoli to then be expelled out of the body through exhalation. Understanding these points will help you better understand why carbon dioxide and oxygen travel in opposite directions. Now let's review the five stages of respiration. Stage number one, ventilation, which simply refers to breathing, inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. Stage number two is pulmonary gas exchange. This occurs at the alveoli where pulmonary capillary blood gains oxygen and loses carbon dioxide. Stage number three is the transport of gases through the blood. Blood carries oxygen from the lungs to the tissue cells and carbon dioxide from the tissue cells to the lungs. Stage number four is systemic gas exchange. This occurs at the tissue cells where systemic capillary blood loses oxygen and gains carbon dioxide. Stage number five is cellular respiration. Cells consume oxygen and give off carbon dioxide as a result of the citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. In this video, we will be going over stages two, three, and four. To better understand the gas exchange process, we must first review the concept of a partial pressure gradient. In order for diffusion of gases to occur, a partial pressure gradient must be maintained. Remember, the partial pressure of a gas is essentially how much of a particular gas is in an enclosed space. It's like the concentration of a gas in an area. There are different partial pressure gradients at the lungs and tissues because the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide are different in the alveoli, blood, and tissues in these areas. Additionally, it's important to understand that molecules move from high partial pressure to low partial pressure. For example, in this case, we see that the concentration of these green molecules is higher on this side of the membrane. However, over time, the molecules diffuse into the side where there is a lower concentration. This exact same concept applies to the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide gas molecules. In just a moment, we will discuss the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs and tissues, as well as their partial pressures in each area. Another important concept to understand is the way surface area affects gas exchange. The greater the surface area, the more efficient the gas exchange. To better understand this, let's go over two examples. In the case of emphysema, when the alveolar walls are damaged, there is a reduction in the amount of gas exchange at the lungs. As we can see in this picture, the alveoli to the right are more flatter and more constricted compared to the normal alveoli on the left, which are rounder and more spacious. This is because of the buildup of non-functional scar tissue around the alveoli in the emphysematous tissue. Example number two. Animals that need more energy have a greater surface area because they need more oxygen to metabolize more nutrients and in turn produce more energy. The picture below shows how mammals have a greater lung surface area than amphibians because they require more energy to carry out their daily functions. Therefore, the greater the surface area, the more efficient the gas exchange. Now that we have briefly discussed partial pressure gradients in the effect of respiratory surface area on gas exchange, we are ready to discuss pulmonary and systemic gas exchange. Let's first discuss pulmonary gas exchange, which occurs at the interface of the alveoli and capillaries in the lungs. Here we see that oxygen is being picked up by the deoxygenated red blood cells coming from the pulmonary arteries. The carbon dioxide is diffusing from the blood plasma and blood cells into the alveolar space. 
If we look at the partial pressures, we see how oxygen's partial pressure is higher, meaning oxygen's molecule concentration is higher in the alveoli than in the pulmonary capillaries. You can see how the partial pressure is 100 millimeters of mercury in the alveolar space, while it is 40 millimeters of mercury in the deoxygenated blood. As a result of this gradient, oxygen diffuses into the blood and binds to hemoglobin in red blood cells. We see that it is the opposite for carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the pulmonary capillaries than in the alveoli. You can see how inside the alveolar space, the partial pressure is 40 millimeters of mercury, and in the deoxygenated blood, it is 45 millimeters of mercury. As a result of this gradient, carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli. Once both gases have diffused to their respective locations, the oxygen will be transported back to the heart to then be pumped throughout the body to all of the systemic tissues. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide is expelled out of the body via exhalation. Now we'll discuss systemic gas exchange, which occurs at the interface of the systemic capillaries and systemic tissues. Here we see the red blood cells coming from here, arrive at the systemic tissues and unload the oxygen. On the other hand, carbon dioxide diffuses from the tissues into the systemic capillaries. Look at the partial pressures. The partial pressure of oxygen is higher in the systemic capillaries than in the surrounding tissues. You can see how the partial pressure is 100 millimeters of mercury for the oxygenated blood and 40 millimeters of mercury in the systemic tissues. Therefore, oxygen will diffuse into the tissues following its partial pressure gradient. On the other hand, carbon dioxide's partial pressure is higher in the surrounding tissues than in the systemic capillaries. You can see how inside the tissues, the partial pressure is 45 millimeters of mercury, and in the systemic blood capillaries, it is 40 millimeters of mercury. This is because carbon dioxide is a product of nutrient metabolic breakdown in cells. Remember the citric acid cycle and electron transport chain that occur in the mitochondria? As a result of carbon dioxide's partial pressure gradient, carbon dioxide diffuses from the tissues into the bloodstream. In the end, the concentration of oxygen will now be temporarily higher in the surrounding tissues, while the concentration of carbon dioxide will be temporarily higher in the bloodstream. Once both gases have diffused, the oxygen will be used in the tissue cells for cell metabolism. The carbon dioxide will be transported to the lungs through the bloodstream to be exhaled out of the body. Lastly, I will discuss the main methods of transport for oxygen and carbon dioxide. Let's take a look at the table here. Oxygen is mainly transported by hemoglobin. 98.5% of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin in red blood cells. Hemoglobin at this point is referred to as oxyhemoglobin. Only 1.5% of oxygen is dissolved in blood plasma. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is mainly transported in the form of bicarbonate ions. 70% of carbon dioxide exists as bicarbonate ions with associated H plus ions being bound to hemoglobin. The other 23% of carbon dioxide is bound to any available hemoglobin referred to as carbamino hemoglobin. And 7% is dissolved in the blood plasma. To better understand gas transport, let's take a closer look at the following diagrams. Well, let's begin with the first diagram, which focuses on gas transport and pulmonary gas exchange. Because where does pulmonary gas exchange occur? If you set out the interface of alveoli and pulmonary capillaries, you are correct. Okay, so let's follow the path of carbon dioxide first. You have to start with carbon dioxide because oxygen can't bind to all hemoglobin unless carbon dioxide becomes unbound to hemoglobin. Remember that carbon dioxide is transported to the lungs in essentially three forms. It can be dissolved in blood plasma, directly bound to hemoglobin, or as bicarbonate ions with associated H plus ions bound to hemoglobin. At the lungs, Carbon dioxide dissolved in blood plasma, such as this one here, will simply diffuse into the alveoli. Any carbon dioxide bound to hemoglobin, like this one, will dissociate from hemoglobin and will then diffuse into the alveoli. But how about all of the carbon dioxide in the form of bicarbonate ions with associated H plus ions bound to hemoglobin? Let's follow the path of this bicarbonate ion here. We can see that the H plus ions combine with bicarbonate ions to produce carbonic acid which is then quickly converted into water and carbon dioxide by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. The carbon dioxide then diffuses out of the red blood cells and into the alveoli. Whether dissolved in blood plasma, bound to hemoglobin, or requiring conversion from bicarbonate and H plus ions, carbon dioxide is moving down its partial pressure gradient, going from the bloodstream 
into the alveoli to be exhaled from the body. This was all discussed earlier in this video. Let's turn our attention to oxygen now, which is quite a bit more straightforward than what happens with carbon dioxide. Let's follow the path of this oxygen here. Oxygen diffuses from the alveoli through the pulmonary capillary wall and into red blood cells, where it becomes bound to hemoglobin, which is now free of carbon dioxide and H plus ions. Hemoglobin bound with oxygen is referred to as oxyhemoglobin. Let's now turn our attention to the second diagram, which focuses on gas transport and systemic gas exchange. Because where does systemic gas exchange occur? It occurs at the interface of tissue cells and systemic capillaries. We will begin by tracking the path of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide diffuses from the systemic tissues and enters the red blood cells, taking one of three paths. Path one involves carbon dioxide dissolving freely in the blood plasma. That's just 7% of all carbon dioxide. Path two involves carbon dioxide binding to hemoglobin, thus leading to carbamino hemoglobin. That is 23% of all carbon dioxide. Path three is how the remaining 70% of carbon dioxide is transported in the blood, which is in the form of bicarbonate ions with associated H plus ions bound to oxyhemoglobin. I'm now going to discuss how path three works. When carbon dioxide enters the red blood cells, it combines with water. Through a reaction driven by carbonic anhydrase, the carbon dioxide and water are converted into carbonic acid. The carbonic acid then spontaneously splits into bicarbonate and H plus ions. The H plus ions bind to hemoglobin that is already bound to oxygen. Remember that red blood cells coming from the systemic tissues have the oxygen they picked up at the alveoli of the lungs. Going back to the reaction, once the H plus ions bind to hemoglobin, oxygen is released from hemoglobin and diffuses into the systemic tissues. Something that absolutely cannot be forgotten is that all bicarbonate ions formed here. This is a major way carbon dioxide is transported in the bloodstream, sort of disguised as bicarbonate ions. At this point at rest, the majority of hemoglobin still has oxygen bound because the systemic tissues didn't need that much. 7% of carbon dioxide is dissolved in blood plasma. 23% of carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin. 70% of carbon dioxide is in the form of bicarbonate ions and H plus ions bound to hemoglobin. All this is heading back to the heart before being pumped to the lungs to eliminate the carbon dioxide and gather more oxygen. Okay, we're almost done. Let's just do a quick recap. In pulmonary and systemic gas exchange, oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse from areas of high partial pressure to low partial pressure. Remember that high surface area and greater difference in partial pressure both increase gas exchange. During pulmonary gas exchange, carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the alveoli and oxygen from the alveoli into the blood. During systemic gas exchange, oxygen diffuses from the blood into the tissue cells and carbon dioxide diffuses from the tissue cells into the blood. Now let's go over the main methods of transport for oxygen and carbon dioxide, beginning with oxygen. 1.5% is dissolved in blood plasma. 98.5% is bound to hemoglobin as oxyhemoglobin. Now carbon dioxide. 7% of carbon dioxide is dissolved in plasma. 23% combines with hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin. And 70% is converted to bicarbonate ions. Alrighty, well, that is it, you guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that it helps you better understand the concepts and processes of gas exchange and gas transport within the body.